I'm your host, Tyler Sanders, and with me is Dr. Greg Watson and Dr. Paul Kelly. Today, our topic is the big picture, uh, how individual verses or sections of scripture fit into the broader context. And I think we're going to talk about not just uh, how it fits into maybe the passage it's in or the book, but kind of how it fits into the whole the whole narrative of the Bible. Uh, so why don't you take us uh, take us there, Dr. Kelly? Yeah, I think that's really important, Tyler, because it seems like to me that, that there are an awful lot of times when we teach Scripture and we're kind of trying to walk verse by verse through it, you know, and, and there's a lot of folks that really want to do verse by verse teaching. And, and there's some value to, to understanding every verse in a passage. The challenge for us is that sometimes when we get really deep into one verse at a time, we can miss what the passage is actually trying to say. Mm. You know, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, you get so, so captured by the the individual blades of grass that you sort yeah. of miss the field, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, you have one tree that you're so focused on that you miss the whole forest. And I, and I think it's not just a matter of um, me uh, – only getting a piece of the truth with each verse. It's a matter of mm. me misunderstanding the big passage, the big picture of the passage, because because I'm so focused on one verse at a time. I break yeah. everything up into separate pieces of it. I can't really do a good job, I think, of interpreting a passage of scripture by looking one verse at a time that I need to understand what the thrust of the passage mm-hmm. is, and then based yep. on that, see how the verses put that together. Yeah. Um, so, so some of sometimes the 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 approach that we want to take to be really really biblical may actually work against us in an understanding mm. of the passage. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, I call it atomizing the text. Mm. And look, we can get caught up breaking it down into words, phrases, clauses, sentences, verses. And so forth. And look, there's a place for that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an exegete. I love doing that kind of work and stuff. But that micro view can often obscure because we must always be ready and have the ability to back up mm-hmm. and get a broader view of how what we're reading fits into a larger picture. I put it like this. I can say I love pizza. And you got a pretty good idea what love means there. Yeah. But if I say I love Kim, who's my wife, 30, mm-hmm. 35 years, almost 35 years, it automatically changed. All I did was change the direct object, that yeah. little clause there, and I changed the meaning of the word. Right. Mm-hmm. But to understand what that really means, you'd have to go back 30, 37 years ago mm-hmm. when I met her and trace through getting married and being in seminary together and, and being yeah. poor and, and working, you know, so, well, not that we're wealthy or anything, but you know, <laughs> you'd have to see you're, it. You're like the associate dean. You're yeah. like, uh, you're like making the big oh, bucks yeah, here, aren't you? Yeah, 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 believe me. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that just derailed me. <laughs> but, but look, it's, it's, um, you cannot understand the little bitty parts in isolation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you take the word agape. A lot of, you know, ask anybody, what does agape mean? Mm-hmm. But it's it, love. What, yeah. Yeah. What yeah. kind of love? Big love. Unconditional love. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you know, there are places it's used where it doesn't mean that at all. Right. Sure. Yeah. 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 There's still a contextual. You got to have context is everything. Right. Yeah, right. Right. And, and so, you know, it's, it, and also, Atomizing can ha- can have you mix the big picture within a passage, because if you're breaking it down, uh, breaking things down into little minimal parts, um, you may be missing the author's point entirely. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. And I think I think that there's a a way of reading scripture, a way of understanding scripture that sort of approaches every verse as if it's a proverb. You know, that, that in the book of Proverbs, mm. there are a lot of verses that are just oh, yeah, yeah. a verse and Here's that's what it means. And then we're going to move on to something else. Yeah. And I think sometimes there's a way that Bible teachers approach scripture where we look at every verse as, as if it's a standalone yeah. one statement and yeah. this is what it means and that I can pull out of that. And it may be even worse, I can pull something out of that and then go chase all over scripture to try to supplement what that means. And maybe I'm right. not even talking about the word in the right context, yeah. you know, within the context of what we're talking about. That I think that understanding the big idea of a passage before I start trying to understand how the pieces fit is, is yes. essential yep. if I'm going to be able yeah. to do good Bible study. Well, right. and I, I think this is probably a particular problem uh, 
that seminary students face, or people <laughs> straight out of seminary, because you get introduced to this world where right. when you're doing research, there are articles and maybe even whole books sometimes written about a word. Right. Yeah. You know, like it goes very, very deep. I remember uh, I had a Hebrew exegesis class with Dr. Arbino on the book of Jonah, which is a very mm-hmm. short book, but it's every week you're going word by word and you're just, you live with a microscope yep. to do that. And I think it was the 11th or 12th week. It was pretty deep into the, the semester. He played for us a uh, recording of someone. Um, it was kind of like a chant or like singing the whole book of Jonah. And it's like four and a half minutes long. And it was such a breath of fresh air mm-hmm. to to th- get thrown that far back in your perspective of like, okay, I've been spending weeks and weeks on this going word letter by letter, you know, through this, but like this whole book, you can, you can read it really quickly. You can get to the whole <laughs> thing. Like and you should see it like this because right, that's yeah. a way to understand this whole thing. Like, right. like, yeah, we need to know all the, uh, the nooks and crannies of this text, but we also need to know the big, the big curve that this, you know, the arc that this, uh, this whole book takes. And that was, that was a hugely eye opening experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, I was stud- taking Hebrew and we were pass- uh, uh, translating a passage about Abraham and Isaac in this. And I was just working word by word, trying to translate this using the tools that they had given yeah. us with Hebrew. And I get to this word, Isaac. And I'm like, okay, I, I know that this has something to do with laughing, but what is this? What is this configuration? And so I'm like working like crazy to try to figure out what this is saying about, yeah. is it he laughed? Well, that doesn't fit the context or he's laughing or what? what did I? And then I get to class and I just, I just wrote down laughing and I get to c- c- class and I, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to kill me because I've got this one. And he starts reading the passage and it's, Isaac, <laughs> but I think there is that 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 ability for us to get so microscoped yeah. in in trying to understand yeah. that we miss what's really going on in the text. And right. that's, it's important to learn how to get down to those details. Sure. Yeah. But but it's 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 also important to learn how to zoom out mm-hmm. and kind of see the bigger picture. How did these you know? Um, there, there's a guy named Grant Osborne. Yeah, he wrote a he wrote a book, pretty dense thing, but it's called um, it's called uh, oh, crying out loud! Why does my brain shut down at moments <laughs> like this? This is so. I have another you know we have another podcast yeah. of the school where I interview pastors, and I have to prep everyone before I ask them the question of what are you reading right now because it's really hard. There's something in the human brain <laughs> that when you have like a microphone in your face and you have to remember the title of a book. Well, he wrote some. It's on. It's on interpretation. Um, the oh, the hermeneutical spiral hmm. is what oh, it's right, called. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what his point is is, look, you've got to dig into the details. But as you do it, you've got to always look back and see where you've come from and how what you've learned relates yeah, to good. what you've come from. That's good. Mm. That's good. And and uh, you know, it's it's important to atomize. Yeah. But it's important to even more important to be discerning as to whether that's what the author intended you to do or not. Right. Well, yeah. well, and and the truth is is that if I have to pick between getting the big idea of a text and understanding what a specific word in verse 2 means, I want the big idea. Yeah. You know, if yeah, I've got yeah. to pick between those things, right. yeah. that's what's going to be most important. I, I guess, you know, the way I got thinking about this this podcast and what what we might do with this is uh, at, at my church we decided our pastor decided that we were going to preach a series of sermons on the armor of God and so we like picked each different piece of armor right, and did yeah. a separate sermon <laughs> on each one of those things and I got it I was assigned to do the the shoes you know and I actually had a lot of fun with that just because I was like they get all the cool pieces of armor and I get the shoes. But it was like, but it, we, we, but I started digging into, okay, how do we preach a sermon about your shoes. feet shod with the gospel, you know, the preparation of the gospel. And I was like, well, everything that I started wanting to do with it was building on other things that were going around in the text and trying to separate that out and say, okay, let me talk about the shoes as different than the helmet of salvation, right. you know, or as different than the sort of, the, it just all didn't make a lot of sense. And I started to think, you know, I think we've pulled this apart 
without really saying, what are we trying to accomplish big picture? What are the things that we're trying to do? And I'm not saying that we can't look at those pieces of armor individually, but I think when we start looking at those pieces of armor, we need to start by saying, this is an analogy that Paul's using. What does the analogy mean? Hmm. This, this is an important part of, of hermeneutics because listen, you go listen to sermons and it's just like you said, man, they jump in and they want to spend a week on every single piece here. Mm -hmm. But look, what does he say? Put on parts of the armor. Yeah. Put on the whole, whole armor. armor of yeah, God. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. then he parent, he puts that in kind of a thing to, to kind of describe what each of those are. Right. But the whole armor. And look, you've always heard this thing that the only offensive weapon in all of this army is the word. Right? It's the yeah, sword. The sword of the yeah. yeah. Mm. Look, I'm a martial arts guy. <laughs> I love martial arts. And and I love I love reading about about armed stuff like that. Armor has never been about defense. What is the purpose of having defense so that you can take a strike and strike back? Hmm. Look, you think you think Bruce Lee would agree that shoes are purely offense, defensive? Hmm. No, your feet, you kick with them. Right. Yeah. You think a soldier, you think a Roman soldier would not use his feet to kick? Right. Um, if somebody strikes and they swing swing their weapon and you block it with your with your greaves, you're going to go around and strike again. I just hit the microphone. It, <laughs> what you can't see it or the podcast is uh, him uh, blocking yeah. <laughs> blocking strikes. And <laughs> yeah, we got nunchucks and all this thing going. On. But, but but you know, and and that, and that's the point. Armor is not just defensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me read the passage, okay? Mm -hmm. We're in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses uh, 10 through 20. Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the mm. authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arts of the darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Mm. Man, I just think this is such a rich passage because it talks about First of all, the need for us to be able to have a consistent life given and devoted to God, that all this stuff about standing against the enemy, you know, Paul just makes it really clear that our enemy is not an enemy of flesh and flesh and blood, that it's not an enemy of my brother in Christ or even somebody mm. that I disagree with, or for that matter, even the rulers that I'm facing in this world, but that there are spiritual enemies that I'm fighting with. So I have to learn how to fight spiritually. Mm. And so when he talks about the, this armor of God, he's not so much talking about, okay, I've got the helmet and that salvation and the heart is supposed to be covered by righteousness. And, you know, it's that, 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 that sort of stretches his point. Yeah. What Paul is really trying to help us to understand is that we need the gospel of Christ enveloping us, put on every part mm. of our body so that we right. can walk. And, and he uses these different words as a way to sort of help us to flesh out these different aspects of the gospel. But, yeah. but our weapons are spiritual in nature. The way that we fight this battle is spiritual in nature. Mm -hmm. And I need to help folks as I'm teaching to understand 
that if I get all locked up in, I have to get up in the morning and put on my put on my helmet of salvation. Right. Then I, I've sort of missed the missed the point. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That the point is is that God has given me this spiritual life. Yeah. It's not really all that different from what Paul talks about when he t- talks about us clothing ourselves in righteousness. Mm, yeah, sure. He he uses there's a few command be strong be strong in the Lord uh, or be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. Put on the whole armor of God. Um, I think you're right with the analogy, but I think what the analogy is pointing to um, and what it you know the outworking how it works. How do I put on this armor? Verse 18, pray at all times with the Spirit. Mm-hmm. That that the, the the key to being armored is to be consistently in communication and fellowship right. with God. Right, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And and even pushing be, beyond that, that it's it's praying not just for myself, but praying for those around me to to be, you know, yep. involved with them in the fight that they're struggling with against these spiritual enemies that we're yeah. facing. Yeah. And you go back and you read in these chapters, um, uh, you know, Ephesians is such a rich book, mm. but he moves into these sections, all of his letters, he moves, or most of his letters, he moves into these sections where um, on the one hand, he talks about life within the household, mm-hmm. you know, these these household commands. But he also does these community type mm-hmm. things where he's doing these exhortations about how to live. And this, that's what that's what we're in uh, partially here. Um, he does that. And then he goes into the household things, wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters. And then he comes to spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. So he's hit all these social and all these domestic things. And now he's saying, so how do we get ourselves ready and prepared right, to deal with this? Right. So do you see how it fits yeah, yeah. into the larger yeah, picture? Yeah, yeah. So my yeah. wife is not my is not my enemy. You know, <laughs> I'm dealing with spiritual enemies, you know, she that my ch- my stuff. children are not yeah. my enemy. You yeah. know? She yeah. might be throwing stuff at you, but number one, you probably deserve it. And, 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 and number two, it's probably not spiritual dark she's humming, right? So then if we're doing a passage like this, how do you practically kind of move back and forth in your your lesson? If you're going to teach Ephesians over a couple of weeks or, you know, months even maybe, I mean, certainly you see churches that will preach to a book like this for several months, you know, how, how do you weave back and forth getting big picture and then getting into the, the weeds again? Well, I think, I think that Having folks look at what he's talking about in terms of the different aspects, starting by saying, okay, he's talking about us armoring ourselves, you know, and then talking about these different aspects of that and how they're alike and what this piece brings that's different becomes Mm. helpful. And then saying, so if we put that all together, what is Paul trying to say? I think, I think both starting with the big picture in mind and then inviting folks to look into the weeds and then start to pull it all together and say, when we wrap it up, what does it say for us? What what is this telling us? What is this trying to get us to do? So rather than saying, okay, let's go through and deal with these each one of these pieces of the analogy. I mean, we can deal with that. Yeah, yeah. But then at the end of it, that's not the application. The way mm. I want to be thinking about this is how do I put all this together? What's the principle that Paul's talking about? Mm. What's the, the the goal that he's telling us to try to reach out to? What's the practice that he's looking for in all of right. this? And I think by by bringing them back to the big picture that we can we can start to get that. I mean, I actually yeah. think there's some really interesting things when you get down into the weeds of this. Like this is one of Maybe the only time that Paul refers to the gospel as the gospel of peace. I just think that's interesting. Yeah. I'm not really quite sure what it means, but I think it's yeah, interesting. You know, right. so I think I think there are some things that you could deal with as you get down to the weeds. But if I focus on that and I miss the point of the passage, I've sort of done a bad lesson. Yeah. And, and again, you can you you go in, look at Paul, look at the church at Ephesus. Look at what was going on. And what do we know about the church at Ephesus and what was going on at the time we believe Paul wrote this? How does that shape the messenger? That, um, and I think I think in terms of how we teach this, we got to slow down mm. and we've mm. got to take the time to lay out the big picture. Mm, mm, mm. And then as we go into the more the more immediate specific things, draw them back out and hang them, you know, mm. let the big picture have those hangers and let's, 
hang it and remind again and again and again. And remember, this is the big picture. Yeah. Um, when I was teaching through John, when uh, when the Sunday school literature was going through the Gospel of John mm. earlier in the year, we started off John one. I said, "Why did John write his Gospel? Jesus is God." And every time I taught, every way, every time passage we hit, why did John say so? How does this passage yeah. fix that? How do we hang that on that on on that? Remind them. Mm. Give them those touchstones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I think I think you can approach that in a couple of different ways. I mean, I think what Greg's talking about is really good that you say, okay, let me take, let me paint for you what it is Paul's trying to accomplish, and then let's look at the ways that he accomplishes. I think that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. The uh, another way to do it is to is to start with the little pieces and start to say this, and then add this to it. Oh gosh, what does that give us? And then add this to us. Mm -hmm. oh, that does us something new. And then add this to it. And then when we get all of it together say, so what's the whole thing look like? There you yeah. go. So that we can, I don't necessarily have to broadcast up front, this is where we're going. I can let them discover that as we go, but I've got to know where I'm going and I've got to be yeah. willing to turn loose of things that are extraneous if yeah, it yeah. helps me to get to get. See, to I the think picture. that's a good, that's yeah. a good point is, is. The, the prep side is you really, as a teacher, you have to know what those big ideas are and how everything relates back into it. If Inductive. I, yeah deductive yeah and how do you you can you mix those things mm. um yeah yeah it's yeah yeah but if i if i don't if i don't have the big picture if i don't yeah. have a big idea in mind of where i'm trying to go and really this is true for my for a sermon as well as sure. for a bible study oh, yeah, right, that right. if i don't if i don't have a big picture in mind some place that i'm trying to get to what what's the, yeah. the core idea and I can't just come up with a big idea. I mean, the big idea no, needs to be, be there in yeah. the text. You yeah. know, it needs to be what the text says. Ideally, the core idea of the text. Um, if I if I miss that, and I and I'm yeah. wandering through the minutia, you know, we're just the Jews wandering through the wilderness yet again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the toughest uh, assignments I had in one of Dr. Wegner's classes, Old Testament professor here, was uh, uh, I had a, a Daniel class on Daniel with him, and he would make us. He, you only had one page and you had to make a slide that was visual. Mm. Couldn't just be jammed full of text. Mm. Had to be like visually appealing. He wanted you to make a handout mm -hmm. that like if you're preaching on Daniel or teaching on it, here's a, a handout you can give to everyone in the church that they can understand an overview of the wow. whole book. Oh, and that's I'm amazing. telling you, no matter how many words you had on there, it was too many. Yeah. Like wow. you and he would we would work through this thing and work through it, but it was all condensed, condensed, summarized. Yeah. But you really start to think through like, well, what do what do I what do I need to put on here to provide yeah. that historical context? What do I need to say about the shape of the book? Like what are the major sections? Right. What are the themes, you know, as they break down? And then what's that big picture? And he would really, he would really mm -hmm. press us to do that. But it was a really good practice because it yeah. makes you take all those tiny ideas and right. put it into something where you can really, um, it's not just contextualizing it. It's, it's putting it in a way that you can easily say it. Yeah. Because yeah. if you can't, if you can't say it, you might have the idea in your head, but if you can't really just one sentence kind of say what the book's about, yeah. like you're never going to get there in a lesson. You'll just be circling and circling and circling, you know? Yeah. So good. Yeah. I think it would be really important important to and you know this is something that I struggle with because in in class there's so much information like an old testament intro especially in the spring we got 33 books yeah right we got isaiah jeremiah you know 50, it's probably 66 the most chapters. pages you it's, have to go over it solves it's it's yeah. crazy um so you don't have time but one of the things i would really love to be able to do is instead of just feeding out information in classes actually had take the time to get students to learn how to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, how, yeah. how, how do you, you know, I, I don't just want you to learn the small picture and the big picture. I want you to go in and find the small picture in the big picture. Yeah, yeah sure. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, I think one of the challenges for us is that, 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 that we sort of have this assumption that I've got to teach everything in the passage. And I'm of the, mm. I'm of the opinion that I'm never going to get no. there, you know, yeah. that, that, that the Bible is so rich that I'm never going to exhaust a yeah. passage of scripture. And, and so if, that's true. Then if I'm walking verse by verse and trying to pull out everything that's there, 
I'm never going to get finished and I'm never going to be able to really get to what yeah. the big picture truth is. On the other hand, if I understand what the passage is trying to teach, if I understand what this is saying, then I know I can pick out these four ideas out of the 10 ideas mm -hmm. that are here and they'll help somebody to understand the passage in terms of what it's teaching. Yeah. Even though there's minor details, we just don't have time in one Bible study to be yeah. able to get to. You yeah. know, Paul can have Paul can have a, a, a relatively short passage where he's got three major topics, yeah. right? And each one of them are relevant to what he's saying in that context. You don't have to preach all of them. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. For, or teach all of them. Pick one of them, mention the other two, and say, "But we don't have time to do that. So we're gonna we're gonna dig yeah. in on this one." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And do it. Yeah. 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 I, and, and, and I mean, I think the challenge in that in deciding what I'm not going to teach is that if I understand the purpose of the text, you know, mm -hmm. that that's what ought to drive me. There. Yeah, that'll help you prioritize. That, that if I if I understand the big picture, then that ought to help me drive. I mean, I, yeah. I don't want to just pick out the pieces of that that I like the best. You know? Sure. Yeah, that I want to yeah. pick out the pieces that most make the point that Scripture is trying to make. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Good. Well, let's uh, let's spin the wheel. Okay. Um, I love this passage because I feel like this is one of those passages that uh, probably gets taught a lot mm. to young. It seems like we have a we always end up on a young age yeah, group yeah. for these things, but <laughs> again, that's probably one that gets taught a lot for. Again, I remember the flannel thing, and you got this. You know, you got the yeah. devil shooting. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, even better, college. Oh. People who may be too sarcastic for the, <laughs> the felt, you know, and to dress up in armor. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, I think I'd say the same thing for for college students that we've been talking about. That this, that this text really is talking about an ability to stand in terms of my faith, and that I am standing with spiritual arm with spiritual tools with the gospel and that everything in this text is focused on me living out the gospel and uh, and being in, engaged in the gospel and and so that that so we can we can stop and talk about the different aspects of it but I mm -hmm. I think with college students if if I miss um if I miss the big picture then they're going to walk away with sort of this list of things to do and uh -huh. I think that misses the intention of the passage yeah um, I think I think Ephesians speaks to some of the most the places where where college age people are so vulnerable. Um, we talked yeah. we talked another time about what God you know when you say God, uh, some people are thinking, well, I'm God. Yeah. You know, some people are thinking, you know, they they have their own version of God, and and you know, in the popular society, man, that's kind of cool. You know, God, the universe, whatever. When we Christians talk about God, we mean specifically God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We've got this, this Trinitarian belief. And our college students, college-age folks, are, are just inundated with reasons not to believe that, uh, with challenges to the ethical life they leave. Paul's mm -hmm. writing in, in Ephesians, he's, this, uh, I, lo I love the subtitles in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Chapter 4, 17 following. Living the new life, uh, light versus darkness, mm. wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters. And then in our passage here, Christian warfare. Yeah. And Paul ends up this whole entire section um, there. He says, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request, because all of these things yeah. are places where that view yeah. Yeah. Is, is challenged. Yeah. And he's saying, look, cover yourself with the gospel. Mm. Cover yourself with prayer. And and you know, one thing, one thing that armor does as well, and this is one thing I've learned in, in martial arts, is when you feel pressure going one way, you've got two choices. You can either fight back directly against it, or you can flow around it. Mm. You can move around it. Sometimes the answer, well, sometimes I gotta fight. Yeah, push back. back, yeah. But you know, for the most part, I don't have to give up where I'm standing to move around hmm. the force that's being directed at me. Hmm. I don't have to lose ground as a believer simply because the pressure on the world is coming. I can stand firm. I can stand to eye to eye and toe to toe, mm -hmm. and I can move around. And, and you know, I've got offensive weapons that I can use here. 
Yeah. yeah I good. can fight back. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think about college students too is I, at least I think about my college days and how I, things were just coming online for me in my spiritual life in the way mm. that they that they never had before in high school. Yeah. But I think there's a tendency um, in, in, in those young adult years to really want to focus a lot on sort of getting things right, getting, th- getting the specifics. And mm. I think teaching them to read the Bible the way that mm. we're talking about would be huge. Yeah. Getting them to say, okay, look, you know, we're going to understand all these things about the armor, but the, but, but the question is, can you identify the big picture when you're talking right. about what is the passage trying to say? Yeah. If you miss the big picture, and, and going back to your Jonah idea, I think with college students saying, okay, you can look through all the details of it, but the question is, what's the story about? Yeah. Right. I think that's a really good good question and a really way to help college students start to, you know, they're, they're being challenged in all of their classes to be able to dissect things and take things apart oh, yeah. and to be yeah. able to say, you know, read the Bible with the, un- with the intention of understanding the whole thing, not just how a word works. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. have to be able to do a little bit of both. Yeah. Well, I think we have a good challenge for this week. I'm going to use the title of the book you mentioned, The Hermeneutical Spiral. I think that'd be a great thing to do. Prepare a lesson this week and really focus on that spiral a little bit. Try to go big picture, get in the details, go back up to the big picture and just check your work. It's good. Look at it. Make sure you're still kind of uh, headed the same direction as the text. That's it. Thank you so much. Cool.